Hello, I'm Jo Grace. I run The Sensory Project, which is an organisation that seeks to contribute to a future in which people are understood in spite of their differences. And we do that through um, the idea that if you have the right knowledge and a little bit of creativity, then inexpensive items can become effective sensory tools for inclusion. Um, I was with you this morning for a webinar about the vulnerabilities of children with hidden disabilities and that webinar was recorded and was to be sent out to you but unfortunately the recording didn't work so I've been asked to do my presentation again um, I'm very sorry I can't, I can't because I just chatted to you for 20 minutes I've no idea what I said so I'm going to chat to you for another 20 minutes and hope that I say similar things so we were talking about the vulnerability of children who have hidden conditions and that's the vulnerability of them acquiring secondary conditions and you were an audience of people who work in the early years but this video might now be seen by people who work in different settings or are supporting people of different ages so that vulnerability to acquiring secondary conditions um, stays throughout your lifespan um, but it is especially relevant in the early years because those hidden conditions can be all the more hidden. They can have not yet been identified. And so we are thinking about neurodivergent conditions like autism or ADHD or disorders like um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, basically anything you can't see, the differences that you can't see. And the language and the stories that we use around these children are so important to their later life outcomes and sometimes when people talk about shifting language it can just seem like they're being fussy like oh you shouldn't say that you should say this and if that's your understanding of it then yes it will seem incredibly nitpicky and pernickety and just like you're being a bit too I don't know namby pamby or gentle or you just need to toughen the children up a bit that sort of but when you appreciate what happens as a consequence of the language choices that we make and the stories that we tell, then you realise its power and then you have it in your hands as a, as a power for good and it no longer seems fussy, it seems amazing. And so what I am, as well as somebody who runs the sensory projects, is I'm a big research geek. And if you want to test that theory, come and find me on Twitter where you'll find me at at Joe three grace so just j-o and the little at symbol grace g-r-a-c-e um where i tweet excerpts from the research that i read and i read research into um sensory differences and profound disability and autism and things like that and as somebody who has taken in loads of this research i can spot a common thread and it is this creation of these secondary problems that comes about through terminology. Um, so one group that it is especially relevant for, and I will use this group as an example, but this is a common story towards across all hidden conditions, is people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a neurological difference in the brain that's caused by um, consumption of intoxicants during pregnancy. Uh, you might have been expecting me at that point to say autism or ADHD or something more commonly known. Um, <laughs> just for the, um, for the record, currently within the UK, within the Western world, we would expect rates of fetal alcohol spectrum that are five times those of autism. So for every one autistic child that you have identified in your setting, you would expect to find five with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So it's not like a little niche thing that I'm talking about. It's just often not diagnosed. So it's an especially hidden condition. And that makes these people all the more vulnerable to these secondary conditions. So what happens to people with brain differences is that they are different. And they are different all through life. So when they're a little baby, that difference might be expressed as they were a fussy baby. They were difficult to settle. You know, that person was fussy and difficult. These are the words that were ascribed to them as a child. And they become a toddler and they're a naughty toddler. 
they're defiant and it's to be expected because they were always fussy and difficult as a baby and then they go to school and they start misbehaving and then you've, you can see how these narratives layer up well of course that child would misbehave because he was a very naughty toddler and he was a very fussy baby so it's no surprise that he's misbehaving in primary school and it's quite often around the primary school age range that those differences get identified certainly if you have one of the more well-known neurodivergent conditions and often if you're a boy then around your primary school years is when you're most likely identified and the reason that you will be identified is because you will be expressing your difficulties with the world the difficulties that are caused by the brain difference and people not understanding that brain difference through your behavior and the reason that you are expressing them is not because having a neurological difference makes you misbehaved it's because being misunderstood and persecuted makes you misbehave you know i often draw comparisons with visible conditions so for example if you took a child who is a wheelchair user and constantly told them off for not being able to walk by the time they were six or seven they'd have some quite interesting behaviors to to express their displeasure with that to you and that's what's happening for these people is that the lack of understanding around their condition is misinforming the words that we use to describe them and so the fussy difficult baby becomes the naughty obstinate child becomes the child with challenging behavior and so on and so by the time they're in secondary school they have very low self-esteem and they don't have low self-esteem because having a neurological difference causes low self-esteem they have low self-esteem because being misunderstood and misrepresented in language and in stories causes low self-esteem. And then because they have low self-esteem, the people that they share most things in common with are other people who have low self-esteem. And so they begin to hang out with those people. And you get low self-esteem through all sorts of horrible ways. And oftentimes that grouping can be dangerous for the people within that group. And it can lead to environments where um, you might get alcohol or substance consumption in an unhealthy fashion because you're trying to cope with difficult feelings inside of you. And somebody looking from the outside might say, well, they had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, so they were always you know, going to be somebody who struggled with alcohol. That's not the case. Having that condition, having a neuro difference doesn't make you more likely to become an alcoholic or to mess with substances having low self-esteem does. And the low self-esteem isn't caused by the condition, it's caused by the misunderstanding and by the words and the descriptions that we use around that condition. Children with ADHD are another example. You know, they are constantly berated for not having the type of brain that we expect them to have. You know, and it's the same, it's the same parallel. You know, if you took the child in the wheelchair and told them off for not being able to work, or if you took the child in the wheelchair and said, you unless you can walk across here and sit down on the carpet, we're not going to share a story with you, then of course they would struggle. And something like storytelling is a good example. So as part of my work at the Sensory Projects, I write sensory stories. And I don't know if you can see, I'm in the process of moving out, where well, you, you can see, you can see all the cardboard boxes and the mess on the wall. I've propped some of my books up to try and make it look more professional. But that one over there, and, and the, there's some over there as well, um, those are sensory stories, let me get it. Um, this one is actually about a character who's autistic. And what you have in these books is just, you know, the traditional layout of a story with the picture and the words. But down here, you have a sensory experience that goes with that part of the story. And on every page, you have a different sensory experience. Now, if I'm somebody who has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, what I have is a naturally jumpy brain. And if you tell me to sit on the carpet and to look this way and to concentrate in this way, my brain will struggle to do that no matter how interested I am in your story. But if within your story you give me something to smell, something to taste, something to touch, something to listen to, my brain has something to jump its attention to and I stay within the story. And I, you know, I can get praise for good listening and I can have all that reinforcement that comes from accessing my learning. And I was able to access my learning, not because I was better behaved than I was before, but because you taught me in a way that was accessible to me. 
And it's exactly the same, again, that parallel with the physical conditions, it's the same thing. So when we are thinking about our language, we need to be making shifts to the positive. And I was looking online, there's lots of little memes like this, and I actually tweeted a load of them um, just after the webinar this morning. So if you go to my Twitter feed, you can find them. But it's things like, instead of describing somebody as strong-willed, you describe them as spirited. Instead of stubborn, they're persistent. Instead of emotional, they're caring. Instead of dramatic, they're expressive. Instead of quiet, they're a thinker. Instead of clingy, they're loving. And you take all of these negative descriptions and you flip them into the positive. Because these deficit-based narratives, it's it's often two sides to one coin, isn't it? Our strengths in one area of life are our weaknesses in the other. And for the neurodivergent condition, they are all too often described with deficit-based language rather than asset-based language. And if you are looking for that flip, come and find me on Facebook. I'm, I'm a person. You'll find me at, you know, www.facebook.com. And then you just write a forward slash Joanna Grace the sensory projects, all one thing. And you'll find my profile. I My profile picture is a blue star. Um, and I have a photo album that is called, I forget what it's called. You'll see lots of um, infinity symbols out of flowers, neuro narrative, something like that. But in that, I'm looking at flipping those deficit-based narratives around autism in particular into asset-based narratives and looking at how we describe things. You know, sometimes it's just a misunderstanding across a neuro divide, like the misunderstanding between cats and dogs, when cats think that dogs are angry when they wag their tails and dogs think that cats are growling when in fact they're purring. We do exactly that across the neuro divide. Something like eye contact is a big one for autistic people. We are told society's norm is that you make eye contact and that making eye contact is friendly and it shows that you're paying attention. It does if you have a neurotypical brain. But if you want to see me paying attention, I promise you I am paying so much more attention when I avert my gaze because I'm pointing my ear at you. I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm not dealing with all the visual. I'm concentrating in my brain and that takes my gaze away. And for me, direct gaze, I find, you know, when somebody's looking straight at you, eyeball to eyeball, that feels very confrontational. That's very aggressive. Whereas when we sit side by side and look out together at a common object, a common, that feels very companionable. That's a shared gaze. That's a common focus. And so uh, there isn't a right and a wrong. There's just you know, traditions and norms. And actually, if we understand what this means and what this means, then we can accept that difference and embrace and celebrate that difference. And this is something that's wonderful for neurodivergent children. This is something that's wonderful for children with hidden conditions. This is something that's wonderful for all children. Because if your setting creates narratives where differences are accepted, understood and celebrated, everybody's different and in that setting everybody can be their more authentic selves and as you challenge yourself to make those flips in your language like those um that list of words that I was just reading my big challenge to you would be think about the language you use to describe yourself around children because you're their biggest role model and a lot of us suffer with low self-esteem and a lot of us would speak very kindly about other people, but we'll speak about ourselves in less friendly tones. And children hear that and they learn that, that self-talk. And so don't be disparaging about yourself. In, in the words of the ever brilliant RuPaul, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? It's important that we set an example of positive narratives, find role models, you know, find books. I, I mentioned that this book's main character has autism. Um, in this book, I feel like I should pull something out of a hat now. Uh, the main character has Down syndrome. I have behind me here, I'm so proud of this one. I didn't write this one. Um, my little boy wrote this one when he was five and it's called My Mummy is Autistic. And in that you have a five-year-old 
describing an adult and showing understanding of neurodivergence and difference and celebrating it. And if a five-year-old can understand and celebrate it, that really lays down a challenge to the adult world. And when Rutledge agreed to publish that book, one of the reasons for doing so was they thought it was unique and important to have it as the child explaining the adult, not the adult explaining the child, as if autism is a problem of childhood that gets grown out of. We grow up, we exist in the adult world too. Um, it's really powerful to find role models, to find inclusive stories like the sensory stories. If you want to explore um, inclusive stories, just storybooks in general, not, I mean, mine are brilliant, but not just mine. Um, come and find me on Facebook again. So it's facebook.com, Joanna Grace, The Sensory Projects. And I have a photo album of inclusive literature that I've found because it's so valuable to be able to have these like me um, connections and to see yourself. And it's even more important for people with hidden differences to find themselves visible in the stories around them. Um, hopefully I've said most of the things that I said this morning to you in the webinar. If I didn't, I'm very sorry. Um, one of the questions that came up afterwards that was really interesting was about the language that we use when talking to parents about neurodivergence and difference or when parents are talking to us. So if a parent comes to you and says, my child is different in this way, my child has been diagnosed with autism, my child has been, you know, diagnosed with whatever, your first reaction to that is really important to that person. So you definitely don't want to say sorry, because this is not a tragedy. You might not want to go, oh, congratulations, because you might read from them that that's not how they're feeling. But you can set a tone in your body language and in your expression that lets them know that that difference is okay. So the big thing that they will be feeling is fear. And so you have to embody the opposite of that. You have to be totally okay. And you go, wow, that's interesting. This is going to be, you know, this is going to be an interesting journey. That what's it like? You know, show curiosity, show enthusiasm. Don't show fear. Don't show shame. And if you are looking to talk to parents about the differences that you're noticing in their child, because early years settings are often places where we spot these differences first, then think about how you phrase it. Don't use deficit-based language, use asset-based. Instead of, he, he won't play with his peers, you can say, he's exceptionally skilled at independent play. You know, as a small person, I would have been described as not very friendly, um, odd, did weird things, you know? And I'm still exactly the same person. I am perfectly friendly. I just am not so good at expressing my friendship in the ways that were available to me at that time. Come and find me on Facebook. You can test how friendly I am. I love meeting people on Facebook. I'm super thrilled by online communication because it's a world in which I can excel. And in the social world, if you bump into me, forgive me for being a little bit socially awkward. There are strengths and weaknesses. Um, I could have been described as somebody who was very independent, as somebody who was very capable of coming up with her own ideas and creating her own play. You know, she's she's in her own little world. There are, there are ways of phrasing these things that are positive. But I think more than those start out conversations, this needs to be a conversation that you're having all of the time so that people who are coming to your setting, as they come into your setting, learn a little bit about the wonderful diversity in this world. Neurodiversity, gender diversity, sexual diversity, religious diversity, cultural diversity, all of it. It's all brilliant, because wouldn't it be boring if we were all the same? And upcoming in the Parenta magazine, which is what this webinar was associated with, you will find a bank of creator apps creative activities that you can use to open conversations about neuro difference with children and they're lots of fun um, you can make a brain box you can um, make little peekaboo brain things and start discussing and celebrating our neuro differences because the world is a better place for having this spectrum within it